All right. Second Peter chapter one. When I get to the end of my life and I know that I'm dying, I hope that I have a moment of wisdom to which I can give some life-changing advice, a saying that will long outlive me, a saying that will be passed down from generation to generation. Somewhere when you go online and you type in fabulous end-of-life quotes, it'll say Bobby Page, blah, blah, blah. I'm not there yet, but I'm still waiting on it. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. That's what it's going to say. <clears throat> but here are a few end-of-life quotes that I came across this morning. A dying man needs to die, as a sleepy man needs to sleep. And there comes a time when it is wrong, as well as useless, to resist. No one can confidently say that he will still be living tomorrow. It matters not how a man dies, but how he lives. The act of dying is not of importance. It lasts so short a time. <laughs> and when the day arrives for the final voyage and the ship of no return is set to sail, you'll find me aboard traveling light, almost naked, like the children of the sea. In the end, if we don't have God, we don't have anything other than an end. <laughs> At the end of your life, what you will regret the most is not the mistakes that you made. What you will regret the most are the things that you never tried. At the end of life, nothing else matters except the lives that you touched with pure love. I'm not afraid to fail. I am scared to death of dying and having the Lord say to me, Angelica, this is what you might have done had you trusted me more. In the end, our lives are valued not on how much money we had, but how much love we gave away. I tell a friend that I hope for mother's death, and he was shocked. He sees it as a failure in my love towards her. Perhaps it is. I don't know. I knew when and why I had to suffer. The older we get, the more reason God gives us to seek his comfort. In the end, he sends us just enough pain and suffering so that we will want to leave. If everything were perfect, we would never choose to go. He wants us to seek an end to our suffering because he wants us to want to come home. At the end of life, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, how much money we have made, how many great things we have done. We will be judged by, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was naked and you clothed me. I was homeless and you took me in. In the end, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. I always like that one. When your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear or death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Our death is not an end if we can live on in our children and our younger generation. For they are us. Our bodies are only wilted leaves on the tree of life. Somebody should, let, should tell us right at the start of our lives that we are dying. Then we might live life to the limit. Every minute of every day. Do it, I say. Whatever you want to do, do it now. There are only so many tomorrows. Most of the things we spend our lives chasing will turn to dust in the end. There comes a moment when we all must realize that life is short, and in the end, the only thing that really counts is not how others see us, but how God sees us. 
Be certain that you do not die without having done something wonderful for humanity. I like that. Someday your life will be over, no matter how much attention you give to your health. Will you look back with regret because you nourished your, mo- your body, but you starved your soul? Dream as if you'll live, for mor- live forever and live as if you'll die tomorrow. Now that's good. Listen to that. Dream as if you will live forever. Live as if you'll die today. When I'm taking my last breath, I want to look at how I used to be, how I used up the best of my life. How much did I sweat, push, pull, rip, fall, hit, crash, and explode? My dream is to be so well used that in my last half second, I will just burst into dust. (laughs) And I'm afraid that this last life quote will probably be mine. Don't let it in like this. Tell them I said something. (laughs) I'm afraid that will be my last breath right there. I have nothing. So what kind of advice would you give? If you knew that your time was short, if you knew that you were on your deathbed and your family was gathered around you, what would be your final words to them? Your final advice? You see, 2 Peter is kind of like Peter's farewell address. It's his getting out the last things because he knew that his time was short. He knew that his end was drawing near. And so he is reemphasizing the most important things that he has taught them in the past. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance." Now, I know our crowd's down this morning because of the, the weather that we have going on out here. But by a show of hand, how many of you were here last week and heard my message last week? By a show of hands. Okay. Now, of all of those that were here last week, I have a golden opportunity for you. Of all those that heard my message last week... Which one of you would like a chance to win $100? I got one one taker. One taker. Okay, come on up here. Come here. Come on up here. Come on. You, you, You wanted to do it, so come on up here. And this is an opportunity. I've got $100 right here. And this is what you need to do. Last week, Peter gave us seven things to add to your faith. And I will give you $10 for every one of those that you can get. Now, this is the trick. You only got 30 seconds to do it in. <laughs> I might as well just go ahead and sit back. Well, no, well, no, hold on. You might get something. You might get something. You, like I said, what have you got to lose? And what... The seven things. Last week, Peter gave us seven things that we needed to add to our faith. He said, and to this, add this. And to this, add this. And to this. Okay, are you ready? Okay, well, hold on here. i got to pick up. Here, you step out there. I don't want you to see my paper. That's cheating. I don't want you to cheat. (laughs) And for every one that you get, you get $10. And if you get all seven, I'll give you $100. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. All right. Okay. Okay. 
and to virtue add. <laughs> Anything else? That's it? That's all I can remember. Okay. All right. Well, you, you earned yourself 10 bucks. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, listen. And, and I, I wasn't doing that to embarrass her. Um, okay, well, well, have a seat and I'll, uh, I'll explain. Research has shown that within one hour of hearing a spoken message, People forget up to, any guesses? 90% after one hour of, of you hearing the spoken message, within one hour, you have forgotten 90% of what was spoken. Now, how depressing is that for a preacher? <laughs> now, think about it. It takes almost a year's worth of preaching for you to maintain enough information to equal one message. How depressing is that? If I spend, and think about this, if I spend around 10 hours studying, I study, I research, um, I prepare a sermon, and then I spend an additional 45 minutes presenting that message to you. By one hour after that service, you have already forgotten 90% of what I said. That means that all you remember about last week's message is that I told the ladies to be more manly. That's all you remember about last week's message. I guarantee you, you walked out of here and all you remembered is I said, ladies, be more manly. And that's, there, you had to be in context to understand what that was. So I wasn't telling the women to become men. That's not what I was saying. Hey, listen, if it's any consolation, sometimes I don't remember what I preach. I think I probably lose 70% or better after I'm done preaching anyway. And I'm the one who done it. Ah, uh, heck, who am I kidding? Most of the time, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> But see, this is the thing, and this is the thing, and this is where Peter's going today. Any good teacher realizes the value of repetition. Any good teacher realizes that it's not enough to hear it one time. You have to hear it again and again and again and again and again in order for you to retain what needs to be retained. The real challenge for a teacher, for a preacher, is to present the important information over and over and trying to make it fresh and trying to make it new and trying to make it interesting so that you don't get bored hearing the same things over and over again. And unfortunately, in 11 years, some of you have heard many of my stories over and over again. And over again. You probably know them better than I do. But the good thing is that you've forgotten 90% of them. And so I'll continue to use them for the next 10 years. So listen to what God had to say to Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now listen, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be... As frontals on your forehead, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and you shall write them on the gates. You think God understood that we have a problem retaining? And he understood that we needed that, that continual reminder time and time again? He said, listen, when you go out, talk about it. When you come in, talk about it. Wear it up on your t-shirts. Put it up on your walls. Put up on the pictures on your walls. Put them inside of your house. Talk to them at dinner time. Continually, over and over and over and over, 
you continue to talk about the Word. You see, this is the problem. We have a tendency to remember what we shouldn't remember and forget what we should remember. Did I say that right? We have a tendency to remember what we should forget and forget what we should remember. I hope that's what I said. You see, for some of you this week, as you were driving down the road and you were listening to the radio and you were listening to your favorite preachers on the radio or on your TV, you don't remember a single word that Charles, Chuck, James, or J. Vernon McGee said to you. But you have never forgotten how so-and-so never paid you the 20 bucks that they owed you 20 years ago. It's true. I was talking to a, den- a gentleman one day, and <clears throat> him and his wife were sitting at the table, and I was sitting there talking to him. And somehow in conversation, this gentleman looked at me, and he said, You know what? He said, you borrowed a sander from me 20 years ago, or 15 years ago. And he said, you never brought it back. I said, oh, come on. Oh, no, I'm serious. You, you never brought it back. I said, so you're telling me for 15 years you never said anything to me about that sander that I borrowed? Oh, no. No, I never said nothing. I said, oh. I said, surely I brought it back. To which his wife replied, no, no, you never brought it back. 15 years. So I went out and spent 20 bucks on a sander and brought it over there because I have no idea where the sander went. But we have a tendency to never forget what we should forget. And we forget what we should remember. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. You see, therefore refers back to... Peter's last teachings where he talked about we will add these to our faith and 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 Betty to your defense when I would when I come up with that illustration it probably took me about three or four minutes to figure out and to remember what those were but just to remind us remember virtue the word meant to be manly to be courageous to be bold the second thing was to add knowledge That's experiential knowledge. Temperance, that's self-control. Deny your flesh. Deny the things that you know you shouldn't be doing. Patience, that's perseverance and suffering. Godliness, that's living a life that God is pleased with. And then the last two is Philadelphia or brotherly love and agape love. And that's the, the love of choice, the love of those around us. But he had just told us that we needed to add those seven things to our faith. And he said, because of that, that we will enter into the kingdom of of, of heaven, into the very presence of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he says, because of that, that's the reason I'm going to continue to remind you of these things. Because one day, you need to enter into heaven prepared. You need to enter into heaven having lived a life that is pleasing to God. You see, Peter never wants us to forget that we're saved. Remember when Peter taught us, he said, sometimes... We get so far out of whack. Some so time, sometimes we allow so much to happen in our life that we even forget that God for, forgave us of our sins. And he said, I will be ready to remind you of things. I will be ready to always remind you of these things. You see, when I preach a topic that we have already covered my thing is be patient and listen when you understand the benefits uh, of of hearing things over and over again that repetition that's how you you learn that's how you maintain all of those things just remember i need to preach that same topic at least 10 times or you're not going to maintain it hmm You think it works that way? 
You think I need to preach the same message ten times and then by the end of those ten, you would finally get it? I don't know. How many, how many messages did Peter teach us out of First Peter that had to deal with suffering? Man, it seemed like every week we was talking about suffering, one after another, after another, after another. Peter continually taught on the subject of suffering. You see, the most important topics that you find in Scripture are repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again. The number one topic is God revealing himself to us. You see that over and over. and Back in the First Testament into the Second Testament, you see those things over and over and over again. God revealing himself. Number, the second thing is love. As we mentioned, uh, Philadelphia, we talked about agape. There are, are, are many times throughout the Bible that, that God teaches us to love. And the third one is money. The third topic, the Bible speaks over 800 times about finances, about money, and what we're supposed to do with those things. And then there's faith, and then there's suffering, there's prayer, there's joy, there's heaven, there's hell. Over and over and over, these subjects come up. Over and over and over, God teaches these things to us because they're important, and we need to memorize them, and we need to learn those. You see, if we were really serious about learning, if we really wanted to get this into our heart, if we really wanted to get a hold of this, we would want to hear those subjects over and over and over. I can't tell you how many times I drive down the road and sometimes I, I get out into areas where they don't have a good Christian radio station. And, as, and I've said before, I don't, not that I'm opposed to, to the music or to praise and worship songs, I just prefer to listen to, to messages. And when I get outside, I'll get on Google and I'll find one of my favorite preachers. And I'll pull it up and I'll listen to it. And, and my, uh, the radio on my truck pipes it right out through the speakers. And, and there are times, I can't tell you how many times I'll listen to a message. And then the next day I'll play the same message over again. And then the next day I'll play it. There are times during the week I'll listen to the same message four or five times. And it seems like every time I listen, I find something else in there, something else that I didn't remember or something else I didn't get a hold of the first time I listened. Even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I know, he says, listen, I know that you already know this stuff. And I hear... Uh, Some of the, the, the greatest messages on these topics, I know that you've heard these messages before. I know that you've heard these topics before. I know we've covered them, and I'm sure you've heard better messages than I bring here on those subjects. But I will continue to preach them as long as God allows me to. I used to worry about running out of material when I first started to preach. Now I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time before I run out of material established he said you are established you're settled it's a settled condition firmly established in these things not only do you know about these things but you're doing them not only have you have you gotten a hold of this not only do you understand it but now you are doing it you're applying it to your life he said I know that but I'm going to continue to remind you and uh, so that you never forget for you that understand it, for you that are applying it, this is just a friendly reminder. It's just a friendly reminder. He said, listen, you're doing good. You're reading your Bible. You're coming to church. You're loving on each other. You're praying. You're helping the needy. So for you, this is just a friendly reminder. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by reminder. Listen, we all have a part in this body of Christ. We all have a job to do. We all have something that has to be accomplished. And my duty, my righteous duty, is to stir you up. It's to never let you settle 
to never let you become comatose, to never let you get lazy by way of preaching and teaching. That is my position. That is my job. That is what I have been called to do, is to stir you up, to keep you stirred up. And as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, and the word here means in this tent. How many of you have ever been camping? Been camping? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How many of you would like to live in a tent forever? <laughs> you know, it was fun while I did it. It was okay when I did it. But, you know, I spent several months over in the desert when I was in the military. And, and we spent months and months and months in a tent. And it wasn't very fun. And it was so good to get out of that tent. And they were so undependable. I remember one night, in the middle of the night, we're all dead asleep. It's, it's I don't know, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. And a storm blew through and blew the tent over on top of it. Now, I was content just to lay there, and, and I was underneath the tent, right? But, oh, no, they wanted to get up in the middle of the night and put the tent back up. They are so into, they're just not good to live forever in. A tent is temporary. A tent is short term. And that's how we should view these bodies. These bodies were never, these bodies as they are right now were never intended to last forever. The day you're born, you are beginning to die, whether you realize it or not. And some people treat these tents like they are going to last forever. Their flaps begin to sag, and so they have them lifted. Their material gets a little wrinkled, so they tuck and they tighten them. And their color fades, so they redye the covering. <laughs> but he says, I want to stir you up. He said, I want to stir you up. I want to keep you stirred up. That means to arouse you completely, to thoroughly awaken you from sleep or from drowsiness. You see, we have a tendency to begin to get a little sluggish, to act just a little bit lazy. I had someone tell me one time, they said, you know, we are so excited about the Word of God, and the reason we're so excited about the Word of God is because you're excited about the Word of God. Yes, 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 that's what it's all about. So, how many of you would agree, those of you who, have, who come to our Sunday school class or our Sunday night class or our Wednesday night service, how many of you would agree that sometimes we get a little wound up in our classes? Sometimes we get a little wound up in there. Sometimes we get a little excited in there. But man, when you get into the Word of God and you find something in there that you have never seen before, it's exciting. Oh my goodness, it's like, I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of those doors and man, man, that was good. Man, that was good. Where in the world, why haven't I seen that before? And we stir each other up. And he said, by way of reminder, he says, consistently and tirelessly, that's the only acceptable way to teach the major themes of the Bible consistently and tirelessly. I don't care how many times you've heard it. You still need to be reminded about the truth. So, of everybody that's here today, who's been saved the longest? Somebody give me a number and we'll go from there. Frank, how long have you been saved? Too long. Nineteen seventy-two. <laughs> so somebody give me that. Was that forty, forty-seven years? Is that right? Has anybody been saved longer than forty-seven years? So Frank, how long have you been saved, Karen? Twelve months after that. <laughs> So 46 years and 11 months. <laughs> but 47 years. So it's safe to say that you've probably heard 
about every topic that there is in the Bible in 47 years. <laughs> no? You don't feel that? That's what you hear. See, listen, this is, but this is my point. Even Frank, even Karen, who, who have been saved for over 47 years, need to be reminded the truth. They continue to come not because they've got it all figured out, not because they feel like they have reached the pinnacle and they understand everything, but they continue to come because they know that there's more that they need to learn, that they need to be reminded, they need to be brought before the Word of God every week. Look at verse 14 again. Knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle or tent, even as our Lord Jesus Christ, has shown me. You see, Peter knew that his time was near. As I had mentioned earlier, this is kind of his farewell address. He's, he's bringing up the things that he had been teaching them over time. He described it as a laying aside of his tent. Paul used the same analogy in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, when he says, for I know that when this earthly tent that we live in is taken down, that is when we die and we leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. Yes. He says it's imminent which means it's soon or it's going to be swift or both. For Peter, it could be both. You see, Peter's already in his 70s at this time. And Jesus had told him, listen to what Jesus told him in John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, this he said to signifying by the way, by what kind of death that he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So, specifically, Jesus told him by talking about how his hands would be spread apart. He was talking about crucifixion. And he told Peter, he said, listen, when you're old. So can you imagine, you, you ever wonder how he was laying in prison and, and at the threat of death and he just fell asleep? He's like, I know I ain't going to die. I'm still young. Jesus told me that when I die, I'm going to be old. It's going to be swift. It's gonna, they're going to crucify. Well, of course, he, you know, he understood. And listen, tradition says that the first thing that happened was is Peter watched his wife crucified. And then they took him, and when it was his time to be crucified, he said, don't crucify me the way my Lord was crucified. I'm not worthy of that. And he asked to be crucified upside down. And so Peter knew his time was short. He was 70 years old. And Jesus had told him, when you're old, it'll come quickly. They're going to do it in a way you don't want to do it, I promise you. It ain't going to be good. He says, listen, after my decease or after my departure, after I leave this life, after he goes from one place to the other, when he leaves earth and he enters into heaven, he said, the most important thing is not that you remember my death. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you remember what I've been teaching you. It doesn't matter that I'm going to die. It doesn't matter how I'm going to die. But when I leave here, I want to leave you something that you can continue to go back to, that you can continue to learn from. Do you think he had any idea how far this letter would go? Do you think that when he wrote this letter for the church, that he had any inkling or any understanding how far it would travel? That how long it would last past his own death? I wonder. Listen, Peter simply wants us to embrace repetition. To understand that repetition is needed. You see, that's how we learn. That's how we maintain. That's how we get a hold of things. 
And I want you to know that as long as I am able, I will do my best to find new and fresh ways to, to remind you of old truths. And by the way, all of your tents look fabulous. Would you stand to your feet? Thank you for coming out this morning. You always wonder on a day like this if I'll be preaching to my wife. But thank you for coming out, and please be careful. I, as, as we came in this morning, uh, I had looked at the weather, and by the time noon rolled around, it was supposed to be over 35 degrees, so uh, hopefully all the ice will be melted and, and you'll have a, a clean trip home. But thank you for coming. Father, what a wonderful word you've given us this morning. And God, as we continue this study of Peter, uh, he never ceases to amaze us at how relevant his teachings are. And God, this morning, I just pray that as, as we all stand here, we realize the importance of repetition. We, we realize how important it is that, yes, I've heard these things before. Yes, I've heard them many, thing, many times before. But it's important that we continue to remind ourselves the important subjects, the important topics of the, of the Word of God. And that we continue to share those with one another. We continue to share those with our children, with our grandchildren. And God, that we teach them the Word in a way that they can retain that. And Father, we thank you for that. And, and now, Father, as we conclude this service, I pray that you go with each of us as we travel home. Keep us safe out upon the road. And God, I pray you bring us back excited once again to receive the word tonight. And we ask all these things in Jesus' very precious name. Amen. God bless you. Be careful out there.